just started it. It's all oh, yours. Beautiful. Okay. Welcome everyone um, to Kiss Your Spring Quarter 2020. This is a special lifeboat strategy session and this is specifically going to focus pro on professional technical faculty. And uh, to get us started and just kind of warm us up and also to give um, just to give us an idea of where you're at. If you haven't already, if you could type your response into the chat, what would you most like to know and be able to do after today's session? And what do you teach? And this will help all of us as we move through today's session, but it will also help me and Joe and Alyssa and other state board staff know how we can support you in future professional development offerings. So please contribute to that and thank you. Um, your facilitator today is Doug Rupick, welding faculty at South Seattle Community College, or South Seattle College, I'm sorry. And I've asked if Alyssa um, would be willing to say, Doug, how did you put it? Like, please tell us only your lesser accomplishments and keep it to under 20 minutes. Is that right? Something like that. I, that's, that's a big ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so oddly, after looking through everything and thinking about what I already know about you, um, when I was reading through like your LinkedIn profile and your um, people page at um, South, I thought, gosh, there's actually no way I'm going to be able to keep this to 20 minutes. So even though we were joking about it, it's totally true. Uh, I, I, I'm on the bottom of the food chain. I'm you are so not. So, um, Jen, would you like me to go ahead and proceed with official introductions? Are we ready for that? Yes, please. Please do the official intro. Okay. So, um, I first met Doug when we worked at LW Tech many years ago. Um, and at that time, I was just barely beginning my career in faculty professional development and instructional design. And Doug was beginning his journey toward online instruction. So, that's kind of how we know each other. I worked in the e learning office and um, we you know, started talking about moving some of the welding and pieces online. So um, that's kind of how I know Doug. Um, I was always impressed by his efforts to lead his department toward teaching with technology. <clears throat> and um, he was just kind of forward thinking. And I've also always appreciated Doug's never ending sense of humor. So hopefully we'll get a little bit of that today too. His accomplishments and certifications are actually too numerous to list everything out individually, but I am going to hit just a couple of the highlights. And Doug, please feel free to chime in if I get anything wrong or miss something super important. Hopefully I picked out um, what I thought was, was all the good stuff. So uh, please feel free to contribute as I go. So Doug has been working in the welding industry since 1989. He is a journeyman iron worker. He's a certified welding educator and he's also a certified welding inspector. He's worked in fabrication, manufacturing and construction. He teaches welding theory and technique, blueprint reading and basic metallurgy. Uh, he teaches face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and online formats, as well as teaching um, in a lab setting and conducting welder certification tests. And he also manages the welder certification program at South Seattle. So I believe you're their program coordinator for that. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Faculty coordinator. Faculty coordinator. Okay. I wasn't sure what the exact title for that was. And then in addition to his multiple welding certifications, Doug also holds a Bachelor of Applied Science in Professional Technical Education and Instructional Design through South Seattle College, and then also a Master's of Education in Instructional Design from Western Governors University. And I was reading um, through your LinkedIn profile, and I saw that your final research project was a quantitative study on the efficacy and student perspective perceptions of supplementing lab classes with online instructional modules. So that like totally ties in, I think, with everything you're probably going to be talking about today. So I thought it was interesting um, that you had also done a graduate project on that and that you told me the other day um, that you had pursued your master's in education so that you could help other instructors. And so I just want to echo what Jen said, that we're really grateful and thankful to have you here with us today. And we're really excited about learning um, what you have to share. And then um, just to sum us up here, um, again, um, these are just the highlights of Doug's career. If you want to read more about Doug, you can do so on LinkedIn 
or on his South um, Seattle People page. And I'm just going to put his uh, the link to his People page right here into the chat for anyone that wants to go do a little bit more reading. Doug, did I miss anything? Uh, that's a lot of stuff. Is that me you're talking about? Yes, I am. I'm so impressed by you. So take it away. <laughs> um, Thanks again for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, I thank you. I I am passionate about um, about uh, integrating online education in professional technical education. Um, I, I sent out a survey uh, about a year ago, I think, asking welding instructors, you know, how many of you use online education in your teaching? And the biggest response I got was you cannot do it. Um, you know, I, I, but I've been doing it for a couple of years. Um, and uh, we did, we have determined that it, you know, it works, it works. Um, so, but, but thank you for the introduction. Um, I do want to be a help um, and not just in welding, but in, in other prof tech um, areas of study where you have hands-on lab. Um, obviously there's, there are things that you do in lab that you cannot replicate online, um, you know, I, I can't really give a welding test online to certify somebody to be a welder. Um, but there are a lot of things that we do that we can integrate to an online environment. So. And Doug, um, before, sorry, just before, before we, before we go, I just want to say a couple ground rules just about um, today's session for folks. Um, yes. So I just wanted to say very quickly that Joe Monroe, Alyssa Sells and I will be monitoring the chat today. Um, and I, and, and before we go on, I did want to just say really quickly why we're offering this session. And to folks, to the 74 people in this virtual room, we really wanted to create an, an experience to just let you know you are not alone. I know a lot of people feel alone right now. They feel overwhelmed. And we really wanted you to know you're not. Um, the state the state board is here for you. Your colleagues are here for you. We really want to support you during this time. Um, another thing that we're really hoping that you walk away with is hope that you can do this and that it might not actually be as bad as you thought. That actually it, it could even inform when you get back into your classroom that what you do online could really inform your instruction going forward. And finally, we really want to provide you with lifeboat strategies to just get your first and second week up uh, online, up and running. I know that I've talked to a lot of faculty from a lot of different disciplines, and I think there's this weird pressure people are putting on themselves to think that they have to birth a perfect replica of what they do face to face except online and do it all like by yesterday and we just really don't want you to feel like that we really want you to just think about what can you do to just get your first two weeks up and running in a way that's sustainable for you and for your students and doug is really going to show us through example some good ideas about how to do that and finally um go ahead and type any question you have into that as you go because um, and if and if it's related to what Doug is talking about, we'll stop him at appropriate times and ask him your question. Um, if it's a basic question, we're going to post a link into the chat so you can kind of explore that. We ha we also have some e-learners on the call, so uh, anyone feel free to answer um, during the chat. And then for follow-ups. I'd like to let you know that uh, you could put your email into the chat if you want to be emailed the link to this recording directly. And we will also be sending out a survey link if you want to sign up for a community of practice to support you. And there's one chat, there's one comment in the chat link that I wanted to read to everyone in this crazy time. How do we get together as specific discipline area teachers to be a useful group and not have every school and every teacher trying to figure out how to teach classes. Trent, I can't wait to describe what a community of practice is. So if you're interested in being part of that, I see people are already in their emails into the chat. Makes me so happy. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Doug, I'm turning it over to you. And um, let's get started. Okay. Um, so I'm, I've, I've been asked to... Um, 
walk through one of my classes. So I'm going to uh, show you what I've done for uh, one of my welding classes. Um, you know, as, as prof tech teachers, you know, much of what we do is hands-on, but there's a lot of what we do that is, um, isn't hands-on. Like when we talk about um, the theory of what we do, whether it's, you know, if we're talking automotive, you know, calculating the, the, the bore and the stroke of an engine, um, you know, there, there are things that we do in a classroom that we don't do in a lab. And that specifically is something that can be put in, in Canvas. So right here, I've, this, is my, uh, this is my Weld 100 class, which is a, we call it welding theory. Um, it's basically an intro class. And I've set my class up uh, just like I would do it in, in a classroom. So I have, um, I have it all arranged by week and the content is everything, you know, everything I taught in, in class. Um, so for instance, week one, we talk all about safety. So in this week one module, I have all our, all our, all our, of our safety topics that we would cover in class. And I have quizzes. Um, I, I've been teaching welding for years and every week, or every first week we would have a safety quiz and I would have their written quizzes saying that they've, they know how to do things safely and that has protected us from lawsuits um, when students injure themselves because they don't follow the rules. And now I, I anyway, I'm not gonna go there. Um, so I have everything arranged by week. Uh, week two, um, we have safety discussion, we have reading assignment, we've got uh, the lectures that I would give in class and um, well, let's see, so I click on this and all of the lectures that I would give in a face-to-face -face class, I've recorded to my computer. And- Hi there. Uh, we are working in our book, Welding Skills. It. This is actually the- I have the lecture I would give in class embedded in a video on Canvas. And then um, sometimes I will have a, a discussion format where the student has to uh, reply, uh, just like you would on Facebook. You would type in a response. Oh, can I even type? Yes. So you would type in your response and you know post your reply, and all the students would have to engage in that. Um, in this, I've actually asked them to um, state that they watched the video and I give them extra credit for asking a relevant question related to the video or answering a classmate's question. And that's how I get them engaged. Sometimes I'll have a, a little quiz that the students have to take after the, after the video lecture. Um, let's go back home here. But that's how, that's how I've taken some of the things I would do in a classroom and put it online. Um, I also have assignments like I would give in the classroom where they have to, um, they have questions for their homework, which prepares them for the quiz. And this right here, I have it available in a Word doc that they can download or they can uh, submit this online or they can type their questions in online. Um, and I, I'm pretty, personally, I'm pretty flexible in how I accept my homework. Um, I've even accepted students' homework through Facebook. They, <laughs> uh, just the weirdest thing. Sometimes they'll print out um, the Word doc and they'll write in the answers and then take a picture of it on their phone and upload the photo. So I'm pretty flexible in how I accept homework, but that's, that's just me. Um, that does, that's not something that everybody has to emulate. Um, and then I have quizzes on here. So everything I would do in a basic week, I have in a module. Um, so, so I've set my class up by modules. I, um, I have uh, clicked this first. So I have a little video here. Wait for it to load here. I have a video here that is... Um, Hi, my name is... I'm mute this. And I take, I introduce myself in the video. I take them through the course. I show them how to navigate it. Uh, I show them how I want... Uh, homework submitted, how to take quizzes, how to watch the, how to watch the different videos. I show them how to, they can speed up the videos if they're 
a fast learner or if they're a slow learner like me, they can slow down the videos. Um, so I, I give them a little walkthrough of the class and I introduce myself and my expectations. Um, let's go back home here. And then after I have, after I, I have that click first thing, where'd it go? Uh, click first, right there. Right there at the top, click this first and click second. This is, I've taken my syllabus that I use in class. I've modified it for an online environment. So I've taken a lot of stuff out of it and changed some things. And I just loaded it in as a Word doc and I have a quiz uh, of the syllabus that shows that, you know, shows that they read it. And um, I have the, the quiz up here and then they can, you know, answer questions from the quiz. So um, that's, that's how I've got my class set up. It's everything I would do in a, a lecture class format pertaining to the subject. And I've adapted it to an online environment. Uh, my lectures I've put in videos, I've embedded it in here. And um, I've, I've tried to, I've put a lot of work into making it very easy to navigate. So if I go to student view here, I'm gonna show you what a student sees when they log into this. So, and actually I've, I've, I've changed it since this sample. Um, these links on the side, uh, the way I have my classes set up currently, there are only two links right here. There's home and grades, and I think maybe assignments. But the uh, LinkedIn, library, student email, all of that, people, that's all that, I don't have that anymore. Um, I found that students were getting lost. I have everything arranged in modules, very linear. Uh, click this, click that, click this. I find that a lot of, I've, I've taken a lot of online classes and I find that there is a tendency for some instructors to want to structure things so that they have all of their quizzes over in this module, all of their assignments in this module, all of their schedules in this module, all the discussions over here. So what happens is as a student, I have to click on what the assignment is for this week or what the agenda is for this week and all the different assignments. Okay, so for this assignment, I have to go over to this module and find it and then do that. And then I have to go somewhere else to submit it. And then to do the next assignment, I have to go to another module to do that. And it's, it's very piecemealed. Um, most students I found, and, and myself included, like a very linear format and uh, everything just in order so they can just click one thing after another and not have to navigate in different directions. So um, I very strongly encourage to keep it very simple and basic, very linear, week one, week two, week three, week four. Um, if, you're, if you're just, if, if you don't have uh, a lot of um, Canvas experience, let's say, uh, just worry about getting your first week up. All you really have to do is stay one week ahead of your students. It's, it's just like the first week of teaching where your, your goal is number one, to survive, and number two, to stay two or three days ahead of your students. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of breathtaking, but it is survivable. Uh, we can survive this. Um, let me leave student view here. So now I saw a couple of questions in chat about how to adapt laboratory stuff or lab stuff to online. And um, if it's okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this class and I'm going to show you what we've done for some of our other stuff. So I'm going to go to courses real quick. And hey, Doug, uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. This is Jen. Um, mm -hmm. I forgot to ask you if you had a headset. I think there's a little bit of a crackle. Do you by chance have a headset? And if uh, you don't, don't worry. It's no big deal. Not, not handy. Okay, not sorry handy. about that. I hope if fault. I turn my speaker down. Um, maybe or just be close to the audio um, okay. source. Thank you so much. And everyone, I'm sorry um, about that. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Um, I was going to ask, are there any questions about um, this class that I just went through before I move on to the, this other thing I want to show you in the chat or anything? Uh, Joe or Alyssa, is there anything in the chat that jumps out to you right now? Not so far. 
Um, there's lots in there, um, but he's, I'd like to hear him go a little bit further in what he's uh, describing. I don't know. What do you think, Alyssa? Um, I, I think uh, Jeremy Thorne has asked, um, what is your policy about students reading ahead? Ah, excellent question. Um, I, I used to just have one week open at a time. Uh, because I didn't want students to work ahead and everything because I wanted, uh, number one, I wanted to stay ahead of them. And when, <laughs> when I was building a class, it's, it's kind of hard letting them read ahead when, when you're not there yet yourself. Um, but once I got my, everything set up and rolling, um, I had students that were working different shifts and their work schedules were really, really stressful. So what I did was I started opening two or three weeks at a time and um, I think I've even once opened up like half the quarter and let people work ahead. The problem with that is um, if you have discussion boards where you're asking students to make comments and ask questions and interact and you're grading that, if you have students working ahead, that means they have to go back to interact with students that are not working ahead. Um, so I'm I will, I will let students work ahead a little bit, a week or two ahead, just because um, it, it's helpful to them. But I don't like them getting too far ahead because it's, um, it, it's, it's a hassle grading sometimes and uh, it's, it, it, students can get disconnected from each other. So hope, does that answer your, I, I'm, I'm hoping yeah, that, that's a, that answers the question. That's a great answer. And I just wanted to say, um, just along with Joe said, we've got um, a lot of stuff, a lot of questions in the chat, but I think, Doug, for the sake of the recording, I think it would be best if you proceeded to show us things. And meanwhile, okay. I'm calling through the chat to, to, so that we can have kind of a Q and A session when you're finished presenting your content. That's okay. what I was doing too, Janet, but one oh, thing perfect. I really want to say is that there is a big overarching question that I think would be a great framing question. Um, I don't know who Susan is, but Susan um, asked very specifically, and I would think that she'd be talking for multiple disciplines, um, is electronics doable? If welding can be taught online, why not electronics? And so she's, she's um, listening for that kind of insight as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I, I saw a question in chat, um, an instructor, I, f I forget where he's from, um, and I forget who the instructor, but he mentioned that he's teaching gas tungsten arc welding this quarter. He wants to know what he can do online. So I brought up our gas tungsten arc welding online class, and we use this as a, a supplement to our lab classes. So um, what we've done is, is in our welding labs, we have specific assignments that every student has to do uh, to demonstrate their competency. So we've taken each one of those specific competencies, competen I, I could never say that word, each one of their tasks that they have to uh, show uh, the competence in. And we went on YouTube and we found videos that demonstrate the exact technique that the students have to demonstrate. So um, please, oh. I'm, I'm relieved this link actually works. So I'm going to mute this. So we found videos that demonstrate what the students would do in lab, what we would show them in lab. Um, and what that does is that allows the students, normally they would be in lab and they could pull up on their cell phone a little demo of what I would normally show them or my, I might have already shown them. When the pandemic um, mandated that we have to maintain strict protocols as far as physical distancing. Um, we saw these that we have prepared as being uh, an excellent lab supplement. So now I don't have to get uh, I don't have to get in close proximity to a student to give a demonstration. They can see it online. Um, but that's that's what we've done as far as. Um, taking our lab content and shifting it online. Um, there's, there's things that, you know, unless a student has a welding machine at home and they do welding at home and they set up a video camera so that we can see them actually welding at home and we can inspect their welds, there's, there's really not a lot of the muscle memory that they can develop. 
Um, let's say that, you know, say you're an automotive instructor and you're giving a demonstration on how to, uh, how to install a carburetor, how to rebuild a carburetor. Um, pretty sure there is a video on YouTube that demonstrates that exact thing that you could post online and ask questions, ask students to um, evaluate or um, comment on. Um, you know, there's, we are limited in, you know, there's, there are limits to what we can do online. You know, don't get me wrong. But if we use a little bit of imagination, we can, we can do more online than what we thought we could. So, um, when anyway, I, I hope that I hope that answers that. Uh, any other questions that uh, are uh, next question? I guess. Doug, there, uh, oh, sorry, Doug. There was a question earlier. Um, someone was asking in the chat about where you're hosting your videos, and I think it was in relation to a video that you had made yourself. It was one that showed you. So, are those all in YouTube? Um. I have, yeah, I've got some videos on YouTube um, on a couple different channels. Now, most of the, the videos that I use for my classroom, I have set up as unlisted. So there's, there's different, if you create a YouTube channel that's yours and you upload videos to it, you have the option of them being public, um, unlisted, or private. If they're public, then you can do a Google search and they pop up, or you can search YouTube and they pop up. If they're unlisted, you can't search for them, but if you give the link out, anybody that has that link can get, can get to that video. If they're private, the only people that can see that video are people that you have entered their email address or some sort of code in there. Um, I've never done the private thing because with all the students I have and the fact that I use my videos over and over, I didn't want the hassle of having the inner information. So all of my videos are um, unlisted. So I have a lot of videos online, but I, um, th they are unlisted. And unless you're a student in my class, you can't really get to them. Now, I have taken all of my lab, my welding lab classes that I teach. Um, we have we've developed uh, these shells just like this one that you see on the 127 module or the 127 class right here. Um, all of those are set in Canvas as public. Um, I've started putting them into Canvas Commons. Uh, after I loaded three of them, Canvas Commons decided it did not want to cooperate with me. So I'm letting Canvas Commons reevaluate their strategy and come to my understanding so that I can start loading them again. Um, but if, if, if any welding instructors out there that want a list of all my, all the canvas classes that we have for our lab, uh, they are public, uh, eat, send me an email and I will send you the list. Um, I think I've also published that list on a Facebook page that I'm on for welding educators. And if you email me that, I'll send you that link as well. Um, does, does that answer that question? Did I answer that yes. question? Okay. Yes. And Doug, I think maybe there's so, as Joe pointed out, there's so many questions in the chat right now. So I think what might be best is if we curate the chat questions for later. And right now we have you show people more things because I think people will best from maybe seeing what you're doing. Okay. Does that make sense? Are you cool with that? It, it does. Um, I'm just about out of, <laughs> out of stuff though. I, I told you I'm, I'm bottom of the food chain. <laughs> I have one that that is specific. Um, if if it helps, um, Doug, somebody. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I'm trying to see who it was. I'm sorry, I didn't notice the name on it. Someone asked to see what your grade book looks like, or to have you talk about your grade book, if that's possible. Um, I can. Um, I'm not going because this is being recorded. Well, uh -huh. even if it wasn't being recorded, I, I'm not going to show any um, student grades. But this is a uh, let's go to a sample class that doesn't have any students in it. Um, so let's go here, the print reading class. Please, thank you. Okay, so if I click on grades, 
should have at least the sample student up here. Please, okay, so um, yeah, the grade book would be, it would look like this, and instead of one row, it's basically a spreadsheet with multiple rows, one for each student, and the grade book would have the different, um, I keep wanting to point at my screen, it would have the different assignments up here with their number of points, and the nice thing about, the nice thing about using Canvas is if you have if you have it set up as quizzes and you enter the information into the quiz bank, uh, Canvas will grade all the quizzes for you. Um, you still have to, if you, depending on the format of the quizzes, uh, quiz questions, if it's short answer, essay, that kind of thing, you'll still have to manually grade stuff. And you do want to look at the grades anyway to see how every student is performing. You can analyze questions. Uh, you can analyze your quiz to show you uh, which questions students did well on and which questions students didn't do well on. Uh, so if you have, you give a quiz and one of your questions, 90% um, of the students miss a particular question in your quiz, you know, oh, I can, I need to look at that question. Maybe I wrote it wrong. Maybe, maybe I put the wrong answer in there, or maybe I'm not teaching the information that students need to answer that question. Um, but the grade book is, it's, uh, you can set up a grade book um, so that you, um, well, if you're not face-to-face, that -face, uh, you can, if you're running a face-to-face -face class, you can set up attendance as part of your grade book and grade attendance or participation in that. Um, but Canvas has got a whole lot of features in it that, you know, you're not going to ever use all of them. I use the ones that work for me, and I pretty much ignore the rest of them. Um, they're there, they're, they're, it's powerful, but it's real easy to get overwhelmed and go overboard and um, just keep it as simple and basic as possible. So uh, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, it does. I thought that was a great question. Um, what, one question that was showed up a little bit earlier in the chat is around blueprint classes. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, I'll just read to you real quick. Um, sorry, you know, I lost it. I would like to know if there are any online welding or blueprint reading sites. And then someone else wrote in that you have actually been teaching an online blueprint class. And I didn't know what blueprints were before today. Could you talk a little bit about Blueprint? Yes. Um, so first part of that question, before I get to Blueprint, first part of that question is Miller uh, Electric, Miller Welding Company, has its very own LMS uh, with uh, just a, a whole curriculum of welding classes. So if you are a welding instructor, and this is way overwhelming for you, go to Miller Electric and check out their LMS. Now, I work in the Teaching and Learning Center at South Seattle College, and we, don't, we only support the stuff that our college puts out, you know, Panopto, Canvas, uh, Google Education, all that kind of stuff. So we would not, we would not specifically support uh, Miller Electric's LMS and their curriculum, but it is pretty user-friendly and it is plug and play. And this is the best part, it's free. I like free. Uh, so if you're a welding instructor and this is, this is overwhelming to you, check out Miller Electric. Now, back to the blueprint thing. Um, a blueprint is whenever, whenever, um, whenever manufacturers or people in construction build something, they don't just build it out of their imagination, they follow a drawing that gives them specific uh, instructions. And a blueprint is a specifically made drawing that gives you uh, the exact dimensions, sizes of, um, of an object that's going to be built. So my blueprint reading class um, I've created with, again, the same format. I've got a video of me giving a lecture. Um, and let's see, here's, here's one of the videos, I'm gonna mute it. Okay, welcome to... And 
what I've done is I, I, I have a, a simple video program that does a screen capture that has my little talking head in there and then the, the PowerPoint that I'm flipping through. And, and this is one of the reasons I don't share this is because there's probably a whole bunch of copyrighted images that I, no, there are never, I didn't say that, never mind. Um, but the nice thing about PowerPoint is on the bottom of the PowerPoint screen, you've got options where you can draw and highlight. And as I go through my PowerPoint, I draw. So this is, this is a type of a blueprint of a house. I actually draw using my, um, I have a touch screen computer. You can also use a mouse. You could use um, uh, your touchpad on your computer, but that's, I, I learned how to do this just so I could teach this class. So um, again, I, this, I, the blueprint class I've not put in comments because the blueprint class is specifically, um, it's, it's my intellectual property. I made it here at, at my own house with my own equipment on my own time just so I could have the intellectual property rights to it. Um, I'm more than happy if anybody wants to look at it with me to get online with them and show them. Um, but as far as sharing my lectures in my PowerPoints and my uh, tests and quizzes and so forth, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at the point where I want to do that. Um, I did, I, we do have, now I will say um, one thing that I've done with my blueprint class besides my recorded lectures and PowerPoints is I have blueprints for uh, the latest building that we put up at South Seattle College. I talked to the general contractor. He sent me PDFs of all of the uh, blueprints of the building. And I've set up, um, let's see, here we go. This, hopefully this works when I click on it. Okay, so I have in a discussion format, uh, a page out of the blueprints. So this is a, a beam with clips on it, uh, front view, top view, end view, section view. And I asked the students in a discussion format to um, you know, find how many wells there are or how many clips there are, what's the total weight of the thing and answer these questions or uh, to have them generate their own questions about the blueprint. So um, I think this one says write three quiz questions regarding any topic we've studied so far by Wednesday and answer two questions written by classmates by Sunday. Ten points for your three question post, five points per question answered. So um, I've even in an online environment, I've gotten students to where they're looking at blueprints, different types of blueprints. They're asking each other questions about the blueprints and they're answering each other's questions about the blueprints and I give them a grade for that. So, um, and again, this is, all this is, is a discussion post and I've taken this blueprint and put it in the discussion post and I just ask students to discuss it and ask questions about it. So that's, um, and, then, and then for, please, thank you. And then for my final exam in my blueprint class after all the recorded lectures and the their reading assignments out of our blueprint textbook, um, I have a final exam. And in the final exam, I've Googled a lot of, um, let's preview this. I've Googled a lot of images for welding symbols and welding joints and embedded them into the quiz or the, the final exam, I should say. So here's another blueprint. Ask them what the job number is and they have a multiple choice. Um, how many of these beams are gonna be made off of this blueprint? Uh, different blueprints here. Um, welding symbols, I got these off of a simple Google image search. Um, and I'm just asking multiple choice questions. And I hear people say bad things about multiple choice but well-written multiple choice questions can be very difficult. And it, I guarantee you somebody that's not taken this class is not gonna do well on this test, even though it's multiple choice, um, just by guessing. So hope that uh, gives you some information about how I do my blueprint class. And again, if there's,
further questions on any of the stuff that I've not answered, please email me and um, you know, we can Zoom just me and you if you have other questions. Happy to do that on my own time. Next question. So um, John Phelps um, has a question in here and, and kind of uh, sums up uh, a number of questions that are in there. So folks are curious about <clears throat> the May 4th uh, deadline for um, stay home, stay well, I think you say safe. Um, mm -hmm. And they are wondering, are you going to continue to teach online after uh, May 4th? That's the big picture. And then the, the John's question is, you know, looking at the student out, out the student, sorry, student learning outcomes. Um, and um, part of the a requirement to have the welding students um, demonstrate some hands-on things. And we're just general wondering, um, in your discipline and others, what, what are folks gonna do for that piece where they have to demonstrate that competency? Okay, there's excellent, excellent questions. Um, there's a couple of approaches. When, when the, uh, the shelter in place uh, directives started coming out. Our original plan was to do the, the, the classroom stuff online for the first couple of weeks of the quarter and then come in uh, the last few weeks of the quarter and then have the, the hands-on part. So we were going to split up the, the classroom versus the lab, do the classroom stuff online up front and then have like an extended lab the last few weeks. Um, and then the latest order came out and it was, it was decided that um, we would cancel all lab classes at our college. Uh, so we're not having any lab classes. Now, in our, sp in, in our program, um, we, have, we have a lab class and a lecture class. So we uh, I know a lot of schools have their lab class and their lecture is embedded in the lab, uh, but our lab and our uh, lecture classes are distinct. So there are different classes, different item numbers, different credits. And we have been, uh, I've been teaching my lecture classes all online for a couple of years. And one of the other instructors has been teaching hybrid and what she's doing is she's adapting her hybrid classes to online and instead of offering just our intro class and I think a, a materials and testing class this quarter, we're offering all of, our, all of our lecture classes this quarter so a student can take all the lecture classes and be full time and get them all done. And then when the, this pandemic is over, we'll, they'll be able to resume their lab classes. So to answer that, um, I've been teaching online my lecture classes exclusively for a while. At our college, we were planning on doing the lecture class in an online format up front, and then after the shelter in place was over, having lab. Um, but now uh, we're just canceling our welding lab classes and doing just the lecture portions. Um, but we're doing we're offering all of our lecture classes now instead of just the ones that we were going to offer this quarter. So students can get them all done and they can uh, be full time and get their, their student funding. Um, now, we do have some programs at our college where their uh, lecture was, is embedded in their lab and they weren't able to separate them out. Uh, so unfortunately, they are not, they're not able to offer classes um, because they weren't able to separate out the lecture portion from the lab portion. And uh, that, that's unfortunate for for the instructors, but really unfortunate for the students. Um, so, I, I don't have any. Um, I don't have any wonderful magic wand I can wave to fix everything. Um, but there, there are some some workarounds that we've we've come up with. Hey, Doug. Right. Sorry, there's 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 an interesting question in the chat from Steph Apperson. Mm -hmm. And um, Steph asks, have you ever used simulation software or virtual welding technology? We have um, at South Seattle, we've got three virtual welding machines. 
um, on, their, on our main campus and one or two on our remote uh, Harbor Island uh, vigor program for welding. Um, we have never really come up with a good way to utilize three machines with 50 students. Um, we basically, we use them for promotion, recruiting. Um, somebody, somebody told me they had a good idea. Um, oh, oh. Um, we use it basically for, uh, the Harbor Island program uses it for students that don't have their gear yet. So when they start the quarter, if they don't have all their supplies, they put them on the weld simulator and that enables them to at least get some of the muscle memory uh, working uh, before they, you know, before they get their hood and their gloves and all their supplies that they need. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the challenge I have is, you know, how do I take three virtual welding machines and use them with 50 students? Um, or, you know, in this time, how, you know, do I check it out to different students? You know, that, that may be an idea, um, is to check out these machines to different students and have them um, uh, kind of like rotate them. Um, that's an idea. That, that might could work. Hey, Jan. Did you want to voice that the question that you have in here to kind of build on uh, the discussion we're having? I see it in the chat, um, but it's one that I've seen as well, the theme of, of engaging students. Did you want to say something about that? Oh, my gosh. You know, I wrote it into the chat just to remind myself because <laughs> there's so much going on. Um, so, um, Doug, I think there's kind of a theme and there's sort of three categories of the theme and they all I think kind of are connected. So one is, you know, how do you create community in your online class? You know, like how do you help students know who you are, know who know who the other students are? Um, also, like what do you do to create engagement, um, especially for students who maybe, um, yeah, what do you do to create engagement? And then I think there's a big theme <laughs> over how much is too much, um, you know, like just in terms of like, what is an appropriate workload given that this is this is emergency crisis situation, students didn't sign up for this, you know, how are you thinking about how much is too much? Um, so as, as to, I'll take the, the last part and tackle that first. As far as uh, assignments, workload, it's, you know, I, I taught face-to-face -face for a number of years, and I've basically taken one week's worth of work and put that into a one-week module online. Um, so as far as workload, I, I, it's just basically a one-to-one -one for me. You know, whatever they were doing in the classroom per week or per day, that's what I asked them to do in a, in a week. And, you know, some students can, you know, they'll take a few hours on a Saturday and knock all their work out or whatever. Um, but as far as workload, it's the same thing that I would give them in a face-to-face -face class is what I expect online. As far as engagement goes, um, this is the first quarter that we're not having a lab in conjunction with our online class. So typically we would have, um, I would see most of my students in lab uh, I always have a couple of students that never come to campus because they're just strictly taking theory classes, blueprint classes, whatever, online. Uh, so I never really see them face to face. Um, and then we, you know, we might have, I might have students from another section. They're in an afternoon or an evening class and I, I might meet them face to face. But it's, it's, you know, if you think of it in terms of, of like Facebook, um, there is a, there is a certain amount of, engagement you get by um, uh, uh, interaction online with them. Um, one, thing I, I, one thing I saw when I was at uh, a conference last year, they were talking about making videos for use in, in an online environment. And they were, um, the speak, they were saying that, you know, instead of trying to have something so polished like you're a talk show host or, you know, this is some you know, David Attenborough presentation about your class. Um, it's okay to have like, you know, the, the China cabinet behind you or, you know, like dishes or something behind you um, and to make mistakes in your, in your video because that shows the students that you're human. 
it gives them a, a little bit of a uh, a little bit of an informal, more friendly, approachable uh, uh, presence online. As far as engagement goes, it's, I think it's really important to um, communicate with your students online and make sure that you monitor how much time they're spending online, which you can do through Canvas, as you can see when they're logging on, how much time. And it's very important to, to message them, email them. I've you know, I, I, I've taken their, uh, their homework assignments they've submitted online and I would put it up on my computer and do a screen capture where I am talking about their homework and giving them feedback and I'll make a video. And I don't do that for every assignment and I might only do that a couple of times a quarter. But if a student sees that you are uh, spending time to look at their homework and give them feedback in a video like that, that I, uh, you know, that, that's kind of impressive to me as a, that would be impressive to me as a student. Um, again, you know, another way, another engagement piece is um, when I do the discussion things, I, I always tell them that I want them to respond to each other and respond in a substantive, meaningful way, not just, oh yeah, I agree, that's a good idea, but something that's more contributes to the conversation um, asks questions, answers, you know, I really, I really encourage them to ask each other questions about the course content and answer each other's questions about the course content. Um, it's going to be really interesting to me to see what kind of community builds up without lab this quarter. Um, we'll see. I've also taken, I've, I've taken two stances. Um, when you have discussion boards, for assignments. Um, I have participated in them in answering different questions and I found that when I participate in these discussion boards, the students don't engage with each other as much uh, because they don't want to answer somebody's question because they're afraid they're going to be wrong and or I think more importantly they're, they, they think well you know I'm, I'm just going to wait for Doug to give the answer because he's going to have the right answer and I don't know that I'm going to have the right answer. So I've had two approaches with discussion boards and I, I generally prefer to not participate in them uh, because I find that when I start participating, uh, their participation in answering other students' questions goes down. So that's all I got on that. I, I think this is this is great. And um, Alyssa and Joe, I'm wondering if there's other things in the chat that we should bring to uh, attention. I'm trying to read through all of them to see if there's um, anything Doug hasn't gone over. I think there there was a, a more technical question early on about the chat about not about chat. Um, shoot, shoot. It Where's was about. That? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. You go. No, you go. Please, please go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, you. No, you. I was filling in. I was filling in a blank, and I I was thinking you were going the same place, but you weren't. Um, I was looking at the questions on liability that are in here, which is way off from where you were. <laughs> Let's address those. That's yeah, there is a question about a concern with ninth and 10th graders and the liability of doing any of this stuff at home in their garage. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, I'm guessing that's, that has to do with trying to do welding at home in their garage or doing woodworking at home in their garage. Yeah, and I don't know that that was necessarily what you were advocating for, but it is a, it is a question <laughs> that's in the chat. So maybe you could offer some of your um, expert guidance on that. Uh, and Alyssa, there were some earlier, um, not just about nine and ninth and tenth graders, but in general, I thought I saw a few that just folks in general were saying, "What about some of these issues around liability with the prof tech classes?" Um, yeah, general. Not on campus. Yeah, if I ask students to do things that could put, I, I never ask students to do things that could put them in harm's way um, if they're not at school. And well, that sounds terrible. I don't ask them to do things that have put themselves in harm's way, period. Um, but I don't, I don't ask them to engage in uh, potentially hazardous uh, activities outside of, 
outside of a controlled environment like our lab. Um, you know, I have asked them to take pictures of welds that they see out in the world, like a weld on a bridge or a weld on handrail, and post that picture online and, you know, comment about the quality of the weld, you know, or what have you. Um, but as far as, you know, I don't ask students to do any actual welding at home. Um, number one, because it's an equity issue. Not everybody's going to have their own welding machine. Very few students have a welding machine when they start school. Um, it's, um, so there, there's that. I, did, I do remember one question in chat about breakout rooms in Zoom. And um, I will say this, I'm not a big fan of teaching synchronously or at the, I don't, uh, as uh, online. Um, as a student, um, I tried participating in Skype classrooms and so forth. And for me, it's a big ask uh, to my students that have taken an online class to log in at a specific time uh, every week. Um, it's, it, I, in my experience, it's just it's not been a positive experience. I, I, all my online classes are asynchronous. They can log in whatever they want. I give them, you know, I open their modules uh, this day and then I give them 10 days so they have two weekends to work on it. Um, so I, I'm not, personally, I'm not a big fan of everybody logging in at the same time and having a face-to-face -face meeting online as part of their class. So um, this, just to um, bridge just a little bit, Doug, Jeremy um, asked us, it says uh, moderators um, have him dress, address Kim Allen's concerns, i.e. the viability of the virtual welding situation as a real teaching tool versus a demo opportunity. So earlier, um, Kim had had um, a comment that she made and Jeremy is asking us if we would please bring this out and ask you to talk a little bit about that. Um, the viability uh, of the virtual welding situation as a real quote unquote teaching tool versus a demo opportunity. Uh, Mr. Thorne is one of my favorite problem children. Um, <laughs> not sure I understand the question. Um, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I follow the question as far as uh, using the, the virtual welder as uh, a teaching tool versus a demo tool. Doug, or, if it's helpful, Jeremy added a follow-up point. So uh, he said, uh, he said, Kim, good point, but it's on the thin edge of the, but it's the thin edge of the wedge. The technology is still in the early stages that will change. Yeah, the the problem I have with the virtual technology is it's it's expensive number one, um, and it's as realistic as it could be. It's not a hundred percent realistic, um, and you know again I have I have three well I have three welding simulators to share among fifty students, um, so it's you know I can spend. I can spend $3,000 on a welding simulator or I can spend $3,000 on a welding machine. So um, my money goes to the welding machines. Yeah, no desire to put you on the spot either with that, Doug, just trying to voice the conversation that was in the chat. I think you did that really well, thank you. Yeah, I think there are still some questions around textbooks, um, you know, like, uh, you know, using a physical textbook, an electronic textbook, um, open educational resources. Um, I, I, there was one question in the chat around what kinds of copyright issues are there with scanning portions into Canvas and a PowerPoint. And I guess I, if I could just add one thing to anyone who's wondering about this, your librarians are the person to ask about this. Um, they will help you. Um, so if you have any specific like, hey, I wanna upload X, Y, or Z, how can I do this without violating copyright? I would definitely reach out to your library staff. And with that, Doug, how do you make decisions about texts? Um, if I could use open educational resources, uh, if they were available for my subject, I would use them. Um, I did mention that Miller Electric has 
uh, all of that free online in a ready plug and play LMS system, uh, which is awesome. Um, I spent a long time setting up five quarters of my own curriculum, only to find out about Miller's too late after I'd already done all my own work. Um, you know, I would never, personally, I would never admit to scanning in a chapter or two of a textbook into uh, images and putting them in a Canvas class for students that are still waiting for their textbook. I would never admit to anything like that. Um, so I will leave that to say what I said. Um, it, it, it is, if somebody wanted to, I'm sure they could put a module in their Canvas thing to help students out while they're waiting for their own books. I would also never tell students that they could get uh, the fourth edition when, the, the, when, I, when I require the fifth edition. I would never tell them that the fourth edition has the same content and it's uh, probably 150% less than a brand new book or even a rental. I would never tell my students that um, publicly. <laughs> Never, right? We would never right. advise our students to do what works for them. <laughs> right. right. Joe, Joe's writing, I would. <laughs> um, so, so one thing I, I did sort of want to put the, um, like, I think there's still some unresolved issues or questions around the liability and also around the simulations. Mm -hmm. I did want to say, um, for those of you who are having questions about liability, um, every school has an attorney general assigned to it. Every school has an AG. Mm -hmm. And again, like, that's not my area of expertise. And so I guess for people who are worried about liability, I would reach out to your dean and then have your dean reach out to the AG to find out what specific, if you have a very specific concern about liability, um, that is just outside of my expertise. And I, like, I don't know if we have any lawyers, um, <laughs> but I just feel like um, I just kind of wanted to just make sure that people know we heard the concerns about liability. And I think this is a question that's just best addressed with campus specific um, resources. And as for the the simulations and the and the theoretical, I think there's certain things that are going to emerge as we kind of go deeper into this COVID-19 situation. But what we really wanted to do was make sure that we set people up to understand how to just set up your first two weeks, um, giving students kind of this, like Doug is, is the term that uh, folks are using is didactic, I think, is that correct? Uh, the didactic portion of the courses, that's a new term for me. Um, but again, like I think if there are questions that people have that we haven't addressed yet, about your first two weeks, uh, just getting your classes up and off the ground. What do we, what, do, what, what else could we about or answer? So there's, you know, there are a lot of video tutorials on setting up Canvas and I think most every college has a TLC or an instructional designer um, to help. Um, so yeah, make sure that make sure that you're availing yourselves of all the campus resources that you have. Thanks, Doug. Um, Joe um, and Alyssa, what else do you think of? Um, I just I just talked a little bit. What are you what What are you two thinking about? Um, Hey, Jen, I've just been answering some questions on a variety of topics in the chat. So, um, oops, and I see my typing has gotten the best of me. So, uh, Jeremy, <laughs> that should be good advice, not God advice. Um, yeah, okay. So, you've all been victims of my, my lovely typing skills. Um, yeah, I was just kind of reading back through and trying to answer some of the things that um, maybe just got touched on a little bit or just adding comments to a few things that had been said. But I think, I think we've done a good job of covering most of what's, what's in the chat so far. And I, I can just second that. I've been watching her just answer 
all these questions on the fly. There's so much information in there that we're definitely going to want to share what's in the chat with folks, because I agree. She's been in there just answering all kinds of questions. Um, and um, it's been robust. It's been a robust discussion. Oh, I did have one comment on open educational resources, Doug. Um, I will issue the challenge to you personally from me um, to write an OER textbook for welding and nice. share it out with everybody at some point. So I think that would be an awesome adventure for you. And then you'd have a book to use. <laughs> and it would be all your stuff. You know, I'm, I'm like really, really old. I don't think I can get- <laughs> You're not that old. <laughs> How about you work with a group of other welding faculty to, to put something together so that it benefits everybody? I think that'd be fantastic work. Um, well, I did, I, I did mention, and I put my email address in there uh, just a minute ago. Um, we have a series of about 15 or 16 different um, lab curriculums that we've put together with all the attached videos. They're, they're links to existing YouTube videos. Okay. Um, and that, that's free. That's, those are all public uh, viewable Canvas courses. Um, I was looking for those in Canvas Commons, but I'm not seeing any previews. I uh, did find the three things that you said you uploaded, but they're, I can't really tell what they are because the preview's not generating. I don't know if that's a problem with Canvas right now or if your stuff hasn't been in there long enough for it to have generated a preview. I don't know. It should be previewing. They're all WTF classes, right? Yeah, the like 120 and I just did a search by your name. Yep. Actually, if you want to, why don't you just click on that commons link there and show everybody how to look it up. I just looked it up by your name. Okay, so they're, okay, I'm still sharing. I didn't know that. Yeah, you're still sharing. Um, <laughs> well, maybe not WTF, but maybe WFT. <laughs> I've tried to get, I've tried yeah. to get <laughs> Sorry. And they won't. I, I thought the same thing, but didn't say. <laughs> that was a joke. That was Doug I being funny. Know. Yeah. I know. So yeah, there, those are three of the uh, lab classes that we have, and they're they're all of our specific lab assignments uh, have a link to a YouTube video that demonstrates the exact technique the students would need to do that. Um, and the picture is one of our students welding up on the two-story structure we built, um, just because. But let's see, sample preview. Okay, there we go. Oh, oh, it generated for you. It didn't do it on mine. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Commons, and that's strange because Commons and I haven't been getting along these last couple of days. And everyone, um, you know, Doug is modeling for you how to get into the Canvas Commons, and the Canvas Commons has a ton of curriculum created from by all kinds of people, and so I think this is um, super useful and and one thing too, it, we are we are um, just a little bit over, and so I know some people have been to leave, and so if you have to leave, feel free. We will be emailing the recording um, to you. So if you didn't give us your email address, uh, please make sure that you give it to us. And um, and I also think just while well, Doug is just sort of scrolling through this, I did want to just before people leave, I did want to say thank you so much to Doug for being willing to share his course with us. And Doug, also thanks for just putting such intense learning over the past 10 years just to be ready to help us all during this moment. Um, thanks for, you know, anticipating our needs so, <laughs> so many years in advance. And I did want to say also thanks to Alyssa for putting us in touch with Doug um, and to Joanne Monroe for just helping us with the chat and also for doing some deep thinking about what these communities of practice are going to look like. Um, and thanks to all of you for taking your really valuable time uh, to be here with us today. Alyssa and Joe, anything or Doug, anything else you want to add before we stop recording? I'm just I putting some links in the chat. Sorry. Oh, great. And to, to Doug's classes. To another meeting, and I, yep, I just wanted to say how wonderful the session was and how much I enjoyed the dialogue. And um, just thank you. I, I do have to run, and I really appreciate this. It was a really great session. Thanks, Joe.
Thank you for uh, asking me to participate in this. Um, I'm, I'm deeply honored. Uh, I just, I just want to be a help. Um, not sure how much of a help I've been, but um, just want to be a help. Hey folks, if you want to write into the chat, people are writing, this was great. Thank you, Doug. Uh, thanks to Doug. Nice work. Um, so if anybody wants to tell Doug how great he is, please type that into the chat right now. And Alyssa, thank you for putting in all of these links. Um, that is also so helpful. Um, and Alyssa, are you, you're hosting some professional development on Canvas this week, is that right? Um, I have office hours, yeah, on, um, here, let me just check my calendar real quick. Um, but while I'm checking my calendar, let me just say about the links that I just put in the, to the chat to Doug's resources in Canvas Commons, you have to be logged into your Canvas instance for those links to work. So just, um, oh. that's one important thing for those links to work. Otherwise, it won't let you in. So you do need to be logged into Canvas. And I do have, um, office hours scheduled tomorrow, which is Tuesday the 7th. Um, it's just an open lab for asking course design questions, getting help with Zoom or Canvas or whatever you need. I don't know what's going to happen during those sessions because it just depends on who shows up and what people ask, but they've been um, really great so far. It's tomorrow um, from 1130 to 1230. And let me just grab the link for that and I'll put that into the chat for everybody also. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I am putting in the links to our Canvas classes. I just swiped them off my computer and there they are in chat. Thank you so much. And also Spike has um, put out that, um, and, and thank you Spike for offering this. If you click on the three little dots at the bottom of the chat that will also save the chat so you can save the chat for yourself but I will um I almost feel like it's a, a new movie save the chat <laughs> save the chat um but I also did want to say to uh to folks thanks for asking your questions and um and also Alyssa I just wanted to say I just wanted to give a shout out for your canvas help sessions everyone Alyssa is the queen of helping people figure out how to do stuff on Canvas. She's a wealth of knowledge. So I highly mm -hmm. encourage you to attend her course design lab. And also we will be doing another Lifeboat Strategies seminar. Um, and that's tomorrow at 1 p.m. with Andy um, from Andy Zamora from Bellingham Tech. And so if you want to just get a peek inside someone else's class and just see how they've done it, it can spark all kinds of ideas. So, um, and I hope this is not the last time we talk to all of you. Um, I hope this is the first of many conversations. Doug, thank you again. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, are you still there? Wait, wait, are you still there? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Hello. So, this is Michael Baker from Skagit Valley College. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to get my email onto this chat. Oh, um, can you just give it to me right now? Is it M, uh, M U R? M I C H A E L dot Baker, B A K E R, at Skagit dot edu, please. All right, I got you. This was Michael? wonderful. Yeah, That's go ahead. Oh, I was just going to tell you, if you need to do it in the future, um, if you're in a Zoom meeting, if you hover over the um, more option in the horizontal toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, it yes. will give you an option to click on chat and that will open up the chat for you. And then you just type into the text box and click enter and it will put it out there for open us. Open up. Okay. Do you want to try it real quick? I'm looking at it. I, I don't see that. Uh, full view description. Raise hand. Hide um, it's, yeah, it's on a different menu. It's on the probably on the bottom of your screen. Actually, if it's okay, if I take over to the sharing for just a second, I'll just show you where it is. All right. Because my Zoom room is set up to um, to show that. And Zoom see. coaching. Yeah, let's get rid of my email though. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I was looking. I was looking up my um, meeting times for. Um, for my um uh i can't even think what i'm talking about i knew what you meant you session. were trying to yeah. just looking ah. up the canvas time no, let's let's not close the session for everybody because that would be really bad i'm trying to get to where you can see my zoom window sorry uh. 
Okay, what do you have now? My desktop? Your beautiful, I, soothing desktop. Okay. Yes, I see your desktop. Okay, hold on. I don't Michael, know don't you just on. feel relaxed just looking at that? Although it looks oh, like you're oh. in the amazing setting. Okay, hold on. I this don't know why. Is, this whole thing is stressing me out big time. Oh, okay. I do a little bit of hybrid, but that's it. I don't know why it's not letting me get where I need to be right now. Um, we can stop the recording, Jen, and then Michael, if you want to hang out for um, just a second, um, I'll walk you through this. Yeah, let's stop the recording and then we can um, we can we can have a meeting after the meeting. <laughs> yeah, I it's love time those. for meeting after the meeting. Meeting it's time, time for the meeting after the meeting. Yeah. Okay. And Michael, uh, Kimberly Allen wrote, I feel you, hang in there. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on that. I'm actually, I'm, I'm way out here at the coast. I'm in uh, Westport right now, working on a brand new laptop and my school is working on getting me remote access to my desktop in my office, which hasn't happened yet. So I'm freaking out. I'm sorry. I, I, I just want you to know um, I, yeah, I'm so sorry that you're feeling stressed out right now. But it's, it's so, it's painful and hard. So while we're talking, I'm just checking um, a few things on my video settings to make sure that the setting I need is turned on because for some reason it's not screen sharing. Home with them. 